African Caucus and the Africa Law Students Association. He gave a moving speech yesterday on which we are going to build today on this discussion. Your Excellency, welcome to APJ Chat. It's such an honor to have you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Doc. Uh, you gave that moving speech yesterday in which you discuss on a number of issues, and I would like to pick on some of them. Particularly, you discuss about the fundamentals of African macroeconomic policies, that if they are not fixed, we will just be moving around in the same cycles. What are these fundamentals? Can you tell us more? Well, thank you very much. I think uh, yesterday I made that point that when you look at the history, African governments have really focused by and large on managing crisis, you know, at the macro level. So you have uh, commodity prices going up, and then it creates instability, some macroeconomic instability, political instability. And there are all sorts of crises that countries manage. And when you look at the end of the day, the my underlying micro foundations for economies in Africa to enable us deal better and prevent these macro crises are totally ignored and have been ignored for the longest time uh, since independence. So my uh, submission yesterday was that some of these underlying things, for example, do we have uniquely identified populations, mm -hmm. right? Because if your population is not uniquely identified, uh, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. How do you know that everybody who pays taxes, who is not, who is not paying taxes, mm -hmm. Domestic revenue mobilization is, is, is therefore a problem. And if you don't have that, you will have people not complying with tax payment, and then you will have fiscal deficits, and then you have debt and sustainability, and you will have to go back trying to manage the crisis. So, you know, address systems. You don't have them. How do you implement a proper property taxing mechanism? You don't, you don't know. Your public se sector service delivery is very manual. The processes are very manual, and therefore you have corruption. And that means the lack of productivity, inefficiency. Uh, if you can automate and digitalize the offering of these public services, you increase efficiency, reduce corruption, reduce the cost of doing business. Financial inclusion is another major underlying micro fundamental that has to be addressed. If you have the majority of your population excluded from the financial sector, your savings in the sector is very low, your interest rates will be high, you will, your growth will be low. That results in macro instability that you will now have to manage the crisis uh, and so on. So that was essentially my point that for the longest time, Africans focus more on the bigger macro and less on the underlying macro, which will sustain the bigger macro. And so we should be really solving that problem. And I made the point yesterday that digitalization and, and the use of digital technology has can help, and as it has helped Ghana, deal with putting these micro fund underlying fundamentals in place. Yeah. So based on your experience on what is happening in Ghana, what sort of reforms do you think are needed? and the sort of awareness, because it seems you also need to carry the population along. Sure. So what sort of thinking is going on in terms of the sort of reforms that you may wish to introduce, or you are already working on yeah. in Ghana to address these well, fundamentals? Well, I think, first of all, it's a recognition of the problem, mm. and it will require political will mm. and leadership. I think that when you want to change uh, and reform, um, you need a clear vision, uh, and that is going to be provided by leadership and, and therefore set out a roadmap in terms of how you are going to achieve it. In, in our setting, we set up a roadmap for digitalization and said, look, we've got to put in place the pillars. First of all, let's have a national ID. Let's have make sure that every part of the country has a digital address because that is the way we thought we could use GPS technology to deal with the addressing challenge which we did. So every part of the country, every property mm -hmm. has a digital address. Let's make sure everybody has a bank account. Mm -hmm. That is a clear goal. Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, most people have mobile money accounts. Mm -hmm. Let's make it interoperable with bank accounts. Mm -hmm. So we implemented mobile money interoperability. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, we're able to accomplish 
that particular goal that you have uh, financial inclusion and therefore as a result uh, we are not only the fastest growing mobile money market in Africa we are also number one in Africa in terms of access to financial inclusion because we've been able to put the fintechs the telcos and the banks on one common platform. It wasn't easy to do yeah. because these are competitors. <laughs> but we had to convince them that it was in their collective interest to be on one com platform and compete on that platform rather than try to set up separate platforms as you have in many other countries. Uh, so we did that and then we said, let's digitalize government services. Mm -hmm. Then we proceeded. And all of this we've done in this period of six years. Uh, but because there's been a focus and I uh, was given the responsibility to drive this from the office of the vice president because we need a, 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 a broad sectoral participation in this. So we bring all the ministers together, all the agencies together and say, this is where we are going. Bring the private sector together because the private sector for us is very key to the success of our digitalization. Um, they have an interest, of course, uh, financial incentives to make systems work. When systems work, they make money. And so it's a public-private partnership that we have adopted and it's working very well uh, in the context of Ghana. So you need to set the vision, and you need a political will, uh, and you need to implement. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. One uh, aspect of the speech also that caught attention was this transition from colonialism to African independence in which you articulated that African governments after independence continued with colonial legacies of looking for resources instead of focusing more on investing in human capital. Right. What do you mean and what would you like to see changing? Uh, thank you very much. I think it, 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 what, what I said and which you are uh, making the point of and which is the case, mm -hmm. you know, the colonialists when they came in their major interest was in our natural resources. And that's why they came to exploit those natural resources. So the systems that they put in place in Africa were systems to enhance their ability to exploit those natural resources. And, you know, they exploited these natural resources for a hundred years or so. Now, after independence, you know, I mean, we continue <laughs> that whole legacy, legacy of, colonialism. of colonialism. And we thought, oh, well, let us also continue the exploitation of natural resources as the path to development. Of course, the, 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 the evidence that, that we have uh, is clear in terms of within the continent that that is not the, the sufficient path to economic growth. I mean, we've had countries without any natural resources that have completely surpassed us in the growth process. So we should have rather focused on human resources, on you know, education, on skills development, on ideas, on innovation, right? That is where, in, in terms of the literature uh, on economic growth and development, this is really where the action is. But unfortunately for us, we spend the best part of our post-independence mm -hmm. lives focusing on trying to dig up, you know, more minerals and so on. Uh, but that is not necessarily the way, even if you have that and you don't have ideas, mm -hmm. you don't have the human capital, uh, it will just be more exploited. I'm glad that you brought the example of, you know, some success stories outside Africa right. uh, that have done something different in, instead of looking at just natural resources. The Singapore comes to my mind. Yeah. South Africa comes to my mind. Uh, South Korea, I mean, yes. uh, comes to comes to mind, and uh, they focus on exports, human capital, using their populations to grow. Right. What lessons do you think are there for African countries, and what should they be doing to be in that pedestal? Yes, in fact, um, it is very true that the experience of Singapore, South Korea, um, and so on, Taiwan has been a bit different. Mm -hmm. Uh, from many African countries. They focused a lot on export promotion or what we will call targeted industrialization. Mm -hmm. They picked a few industries uh, which were targeted uh, and those were industries that were exporting industries. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were not just import substitution, which 
you know, many of us in, in the continent did, but they were export promoting. And the promotion of exports subjects them to international competitiveness, right? But if you are just import substituting, you are not competitive. You don't have to be efficient because you are going to be protected, right? So they were a bit more agile in terms of their industries. And their, but it wasn't, you know, just um, the policy of industrialization. When you read uh, Korean his history, you will find that even as far back as the 4th century BC, wow, that is such a long time. A long time ago, BC, that people were mortgaging their homes to educate children. That's fascinating. Mortgaging their homes. This is 4th century BC. So the whole idea of education has, was inculcated in these societies for a very long time, right? So the, the, the whole idea of making sure you build the human capital and what was very important. I mean, you had, of course, you know, the U.S. assisting South Korea and all of that with the capital index injection. But without the human capital, uh, you would not be able to transform that capital into the output and growth that we are seeing. That's a fascinating point, which I would like to really dwell on. Ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to APJ Chat, brought to you by the Harvard Kennedy School's Africa Policy Journal. And my guest for today, is Dr. Mohamedou Bawumia, the Vice President of Ghana. Human capital. Africa has a youth population that is almost 60%, estimated to be around 650 million. Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Is this an asset or a liability? And what should be done about it? Well, I mean, for sure. I mean, for me, it is an asset. Um, but if you don't manage the asset properly, it can become a liability, right? So, but I believe that, you know, um, by 2050, as, as you know, Africa will, in terms of population, will be the largest continent in the world. And in terms of the youth population, we would also be the, have the largest youth population in the world, as 60% of our population is youth, as you have just said. Now, we contain this, this is a po huge potential, you know, because it means that Africa has a market, a very large market yeah, yeah. in terms of the economy. You know, we, we will have a very large market. So how do we translate this big youth population bulk into an asset? First of all, education. Um, it's very, very important that the youth are educated. It's very, very important that we have skills training the appropriate type of skills training. Today, the, the game is the fourth industrial revolution. We cannot participate in it if the youth don't have digital skills. We've got to focus on digital skills. We've got to focus on technical skills. So the investment in technical and vocational education in digital skills in ICT is very, very key for the youth. For youth, when they're going into agriculture, these days, we have to move into smart agriculture. We have to use artificial intelligence. We have to use the yeah, Internet of Things. We have to use big data. We have to use satellite data um, to make sure that there is certainty in agriculture. Mm -hmm. A lot of the reasons why the youth are not going into agriculture in the numbers we want them to go into is that there's too much uncertainty. And that uncertainty and the lack of predictability makes it very difficult for them to access mm -hmm. capital, mm -hmm. to go in and, and, and all of that. But we've got to, to make sure that the youth are going into these areas mm -hmm. to encourage entrepreneurship and innovation. I think when we put that framework together of education skills mm -hmm. and, 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 and an investment in technology mm -hmm. to support the youth, mm -hmm. it will be a very potential asset. That's really relevant because especially the reference you made to artificial intelligence, which is the new big game in town. Yes. The late Julius Inyoriri of blessed memory yes. from Tanzania once yes. said that while the Europeans are moving to the moon, we are still moving to the village. <laughs> so when are we even trying to play catch up? Right. So looking at artificial intelligence, the growth is exponential. Yes. Do you see that as an advantage for Africa or do you see that we will end up playing catch up and not really catching up. And what, what are your personal thoughts as a leader and what should be done to make sure that Africa is also taking advantage of this revolution that is coming? 
Thank you very much. I, I see um, this whole idea of the fourth industrial revolution. We were left behind in the first industrial revolution, the second and the third. And we should not be le left out in the fourth industrial revolution. I think that artificial intelligence applied properly will be a big boost to Africa. It will help us leapfrog. It will help us catch up as well and leapfrog in many areas. And I think that artificial intelligence should be seen as a tool to assist us. You know, and, and I see three main areas um, that we in Africa can really use artificial intelligence. Mm. Health. You don't have enough doctors in many, many places. You, you, you may have nurses, right? But if the nurse is equipped, for example, with GPT-4, and they can ask questions, and you know, you know, the, you can get very accurate answers from these. Um, you could assist nurses, they could assist doctors uh, in providing information to provide healthcare. We're already using drones, which is artificial intelligence, to deliver yes. medicines, yes. right? Vaccines, blood supplies, and so on. That, this is happening. We are saving lives as a result of the usage of drones. We delivered 9 million vaccines during COVID to rural areas, to remote areas, which would be difficult to reach. Mothers who are giving birth, uh, who need blood supplies in the middle of the night, the drones can get them there, uh, the, the medicines there. And so we have seen practical you know, benefits of artificial intelligence. And we are not worried about about it. We, uh, we think that we should embrace it and use it in a way that helps us. We have to direct it in ways in health, in education, in agriculture. You know, and it's the same thing with education. Um, it's not everywhere that we have the personnel in terms of the teachers and all of that. And in fact, even in teaching, you, you need to be the information out there is so much, the research out there is so much that it's with tools you can get succinct, you know, summaries of where the research, research stands in various areas. And you can use it as a teacher to teach your students. Similar with the doctors, they cannot cope with all the most recent information. They can get it using artificial intelligence to get the best. So I think that and the same with agriculture. You can help. So I think that if we focus it in some of these key areas, uh, Africa can really benefit. Uh, and one of the things that I have always said in the area of technology, digital technology, AI, and all of that, is that Africa comes to the table with no legacy systems. <laughs> we, we, we don't have a bed. And so we can make those changes and leapfrog in, in many areas that the developed countries will find it difficult. So we should not use the developed countries wow. as a measure of what we do. We have to chart our own course. We have to chart our own course because they have a different set of facts on the ground to begin with from us. So <laughs> different horses for different courses, as Drucker would say. So we've got to, 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 to not be intimidated. The right. logical issue is Juma, actually, of U.S. memory here at Teaching the Kennedy School, right. has made that point that even the developed countries right. now has things to learn from Africa. Right. Now, mm -hmm. this brings me to the elephant in the room, energy. Yes. More than half of the African population do not have access to energy. So how do you harness the potential of artificial intelligence and other technologies when electricity is not available? What are your thoughts on this? Thank you very much. It's a very, very important question. I mean, there are about 900 million people in the world without access to electricity. And about 600 million of them, about 72% of that or so, mm. is in Sub-Saharan Africa. Not just Africa, but Sub-Saharan Sub -Saharan Africa. Africa. You know, and I mean, if you look at energy consumption around the world, you know, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's about 180 kilowatt uh, per capita. It's 180 per kilowatt hour. Mm. In the U.S., it's 13,000 consumption per kilowatt hour. In Europe, it's about 6,500, you know, consumption. So we had 180. 
right? And so you see the direct relationship between our energy consumption and economic development. You know, ours is, is, is so low because without energy, you cannot do so many things, you know, in, in transport, health, in education, uh, agriculture. There's so much that requires energy. If it, you know, digitalization, artificial intelligence, all those things that we want to do, uh, require energy. So it's a big issue for Africa and how we are able to deal with this elephant in the room. My own experience with our uh, situation in Ghana uh, and when you look at what is happening across the continent in South Africa, in Nigeria and so on. First of all, we have to make sure that the utilities are financially viable. You know, the lack of viability of our utilities is a major problem uh, because if the utilities are not viable, they are not able to make the investments that are required. And you know that with any, the energy sector, the lead time for investment is about four years before you actually need the energy. And so if you don't put in the investment early on, but if your utilities are making losses uh, and they are not cost recovering, you have a major problem to start with in, in that sector. Uh, in the utility sector, I think the World Bank estimates that we need about 20 billion annually uh, for the next 10 years or so for us to, to close the gap on, right, electricity. on electricity. And so if you don't have that incentive for the private sector because a lot of this investment must come in for in, from the private sector how do you energize the private how sector do we, exactly but if they see a loss making enterprise they're not likely to invest so that is one thing that we have to be careful and, and, and very uh, deliberate on to make sure that there is viability of our utilities the other thing that we have to to do because we are working individually in countries it is very important because you know some places we have different comparative advantages there are some parts of the continent where there's more hydro uh, some parts where there's more gas but so it it requires a deliberate strategy to integrate our utilities and not only to integrate the utilities but to integrate the power and diversify the power generation mix in the towards more green uh, energy. You need to diversify towards more solar, towards more hydro um, on the continent. We we are blessed with a lot of sun, and yeah, many places uh, in the Sahel, for example, that you can really leverage solar energy, for example. So I think that the integration of our utilities is going to be very, very important, uh, as well as making sure that the, 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 there's financial viability and encouraging the private sector to come in to invest in the sector. I think that's quite interesting. Yeah. And uh, this brings me to my last question. Uh, there, are, there is a lot of interest from countries, China, United States, Europe, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Africa conference, Africa this, Africa that. Yeah. And you mentioned that we have to work collectively together. Yeah. But how is Africa sit at the table during these negotiations? What are your thoughts on African countries, especially the regional blocs, negotiating in trying to bring this private, you know, sector into Africa mm -hmm. to go as a block so that they can have a better deal than going alone so that Africa's voice is much bigger and stronger? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that you know, this, it goes without saying that, you know, we deserve as a continent a seat at the table. I mean, we are a major contributor to the development of this world, you know, in terms of our resources, in terms of our population, um, and so on. We definitely do deserve a seat at the table. And of course, we are a major block, the African continental free trade area. Uh, has been set up um, with over a billion in population and 
$1.3 trillion economy that we have put together. And so it gives us some marketing power, some negotiating power at the table if we recognize it, right? You may have the power, but you may still work in very much Small. silos, you know. But once we can recognize and, and, and negotiate on the basis of our market power, I think that the rest of the world will listen. You know, so it is in recognizing that we we have this to do with we are going into energy because we have to get our own act together before the world will listen to us. Yeah, I mean, if we go in uh, a lot of the current circumstances, we will not be listened to, but we must be taken seriously, right? And to be taken seriously, we have to do the things that make sense for us to do. Uh, and then come together as a block uh, to negotiate uh, for for very, very important concessions for the continent. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I think I have to negotiate an exit from the interview <laughs> because it's you. my time. Yes. It's really a pleasure to have you, Your Excellency, you, to have uh, this Thank conversation. So much, and we Daniel. look forward uh, to yes. receiving you uh, at the Africa Policy Journal in the future. I look forward to that. Yes. This has been a very good experience. Yes. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Very, very Ladies and gentlemen, this is the conversation with the Vice President of the Republic of Ghana, His Excellency Dr. Mohamed Baumia, with the Africa Policy Journal. On behalf of all those who contributed, in making this interview a success, especially our team at the Africa Policy Journal, the team from the Vice President, and my colleague, Adawabi, for standing up and recording and editing and making sure that everything goes well. I, the editor-in-chief of the Africa Policy Journal, Muhammad Jamil Yusha, is saying goodbye. <laughs>